wait a few minutes to start um, as people are joining. Okay, in the interest of time, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone. I'm Michelle Team. I'm with WWF in the US. I'm the director of our freshwater program. And we're very happy to have you all here today to welcome you to our session on swimways, a pathway to secure the value of rivers. Uh, this session is going to introduce the concept of global swimways and invite all of you, the participants, to join the journey. Ultimately, the conservation and restoration of swimways for migratory fish will support the viability of these critically important fisheries that feed and nourish millions of people around the world, will contribute to bending the curve for recent freshwater biodiversity declines, and will support the restoration of rivers and their floodplains for a range of different societal benefits like recreation, tourism, cultural values, and flood risk mitigation. We're gonna kick off the session with an overview presentation of a recently published article um, on swimways mapping. This will be given by Dr. Tom Worthington from University of Cambridge and Dr. Arno Van Susenberg from UNEP WCMC. And with that, I will pass it over to you, Tom and Arno. Thank you, Michelle, and, and welcome to the first talk in this Global Swimway session, uh, where we're going to present some of our first thoughts and results in the recent paper that Michelle just highlighted on Global Swimways. Before I go any further, I just want to highlight that this is a collaborative project funded by the Cambridge Conservation Initiative, bringing together a number of conservation charities and research organisations around this idea of conservation freshwater migratory fishes. I'm going to start off with a bit of background about why we think swimways are important and some of our thoughts about how we could build the swimways concept. And then we'll move into some methods and results on some initial mapping that we put together, highlighting where the global swimways are. As I'm sure many of you know, um, of the 18,000 species, the majority undertake some form of between habitat movement. However, of these, only about a thousand are considered truly migratory, and as such, their survival is dependent on completing these migrations. Migratory fishes play a critical role in ecosystem functioning. For instance, there are vectors transporting nutrients from the ocean into freshwater and terrestrial realms, and vice versa. They also have a number of values that are important for humans. They're important ecosystem service values in terms of um, recreational fisheries, but also co um, commercial and uh, providing dietary protein. Therefore, conservation of migratory fi freshwater fishes is not only an ecological necessity, but also a socioeconomic. However, the picture of unimpacted rivers as shown in, in the picture above is limited in many parts of the world. Infrastream infrastructure development has reduced the extent of free flowing rivers. Uh, leaving them in some of the, only the most isolated places. 
With this consequent fragmentation and flow alteration, it severely degraded the ecological integrity of many of our, our world's rivers. And migratory fish species are often particularly impacted by fragmentation as it impedes critical movements between habitats, often resulting in local extinction. The most complete global assessment of migratory fishwater freshwater fishes um, by Din et al. in 2020 um, suggested that there's been a 76% reduction in the abundance of about uh, 1,400 populations of 247 species. I think there should be a slide moving on. Yeah, thanks. These declining trends were particularly high in Europe of about 93% and Latin America and the Caribbean. And more recently, we've seen these big change declines also in Asia and Oceania. And it's particularly uh, prevalent for certain groups of species such as um, sturgeons and eels. However, despite the myriad of threats they face, migratory freshwater fishes are largely overlooked by current policy. For instance, few are listed on the conservation of migratory species appendix one or two where listing encourages signatories to cooperate on conservation. In that, due to that, we've decided to think about this idea of global swimways to encourage greater conservation and management of migratory. We define a global swimway as the river and their associated ecosystems to support the entire migration routes of biologically and or socioeconomically freshwater fishes. And we hope that this will help to start the discourse around providing a better range of biological, economic, and social criteria to map their identification and monitoring. The swimways approach builds on the flyways concept developed for migratory birds. This was initially focusing on wading beds and facilitated joint conservation efforts along identified global bird migration routes, with the founding principle that it led to cooperation between secret three nations. We envisage something analogous for fish migration routes, promoting similar protection and cooperation efforts with and among nations, and hopefully leading to greater protection of freshwater environment. Thank you, Tom. So in the next section, um, I will describe the methods and the data that we used for this uh, initial spatial mapping of global swimways for freshwater migratory fish. So we use data from the IUCN Red List database on species distribution, where we selected 907 known migratory species. And then we made a further selection, only looking at uh, extant, native, and reintroduced coded species, which resulted in 665 species overall. We then carried out analysis for each individual species range for all of those species. Um, so I'm just going to run through a little example for these two species shown here, sturgeon and stickleback that occur in northern Italy. We clipped each individual species range to the Hydro Rivers River data set to obtain all river reaches within that range. Uh, and we use this data because it's also part of the uh, hydro basins data that is used for the IUCN freshwater species assessment process. So there's consistency there. We then focused only on larger river reaches by selecting only those reaches with long-term average discharge of more than 10 cubic meters a second for computational reasons. So each of the colors you see here represents a, a, a river reach. And then finally, uh, for each of those river segments, we calculate the total number of species that overlap with that segment. Uh, and in addition, we also calculated the longest potential swimway for each species within rivers. We then also analyzed a subsection of threatened species by selecting only those species that are critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable uh, on the ICN red list. And that resulted in a total of 109 species. And then finally, we also selected endemic species, which we defined as those species whose range are fully encompassed in hydro basin level four, as you can see here uh, and on the map. So for example, here is a species in uh, Lake Malawi, uh, Lake Salmon. So I'll now discuss some of the results of this mapping analysis. Um, it is very important to highlight that these are based on preliminary criteria and they're also not fully global in extent yet because not all regions have been comprehensively assessed. 
So here's some results for our analysis of all species for West Central Africa on the left and Southeast Asia on the right. And some of those rivers, for example, the Niger, the Volta, and the Mekong, can support up to 60 migratory species. And some of the rivers in Southeast Asia um, could also be potentially considered global swimways based on the inland fisheries they support. So for example, the Mekong River provides up to 15% of the global inland fish catch, supporting many livelihoods and providing a key source of protein. Our threatened species analysis that's shown here identified 109 species uh, with the highest number of threatened species in rivers that drain into the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea and up to 10 threatened species in some rivers like the Volga. The rivers within this region are known hotspots for sturgeons and paddlefishes that have experienced major declines due to overexploitation and habitat degradation that impedes their migration and reproduction. Our subset of endemics identified 91 species globally with the highest number of endemics occurring around the Rift Valley lakes of East Africa, as you can see here. So there's uh, six endemic species were found in Lake Malawi. And for many of these species in these regions, migrations take the form of upriver movements to spawning grounds. And the fisheries here provide a source of food and income for millions of people, but they're also under threat from unsustainable exploitation and loss of habitats. Now, as well as the paper, we also created an online web viewer where you can explore all the results that are described in the paper, as well as some other regions. And you can find it at this web link that's shown here, uh, explorer.globalswimways.org. And the Explorer allows you to get individual species information for each river. You can show species distributions, you can link to the IECN information of that species, and you can add threat layers such as dams, uh, as well as a range of other functions. Thank you, Arno. Uh, in addition to the biological criteria that we identified and map in the paper, we also discussed the range of other criteria that we would need to consider to fully map a global swimway. One subsection is the economic criteria, things like small scale and subsistence fisheries, commercial fisheries, but also the, the prevalence of recreational fisheries that give a value to a different river or, or set of rivers. In addition to those economic criteria, there is also a number of important social criteria that should Inland fisheries play a critical role in providing food security in many parts of the world although their true value is often masked by poor data availability. Incorporating that data on subsistence fisheries would be incredibly valuable in mapping where the big global swimways are. In addition, migratory fishes also provide many less tangible benefits, such as religious or cultural benefits. For example, indigenous peoples across the North Pacific Rim have harvested species using uh, cultural and spiritual belief for millennia, and these sorts of things need to be included. Our primary objective in this talk and also in the paper is initiate the discussion around swimways. Future research, policy and conservation activities will need to bring together a large range of actors across the world and from different organizations. I'm just gonna outline some future directions that we need to cover when thinking about this. Firstly, we need to quantify and refine the migration routes. Mapping the actual migration routes within a basin will allow us to more accurately evaluate the impact of human activities on freshwater migration species. We also need to engage a wider audience to address data. For instance, some factors that describe a global swimway are less amenable to the creation of spatial metrics. We're thinking about things like religious or cultural factors. So bringing together a big group would help us to, to try and map those. When we think about identifying a single swimway, we need a holistic approach that will be underpinned by metrics of different types and across different it's important that the framework be flexible enough to incorporate this range of data, requiring considerable discussion and debate on about best how to compare swimwear. We envisage a hierarchical approach where you could be applied across a range of scales. For instance, a swimway may be triggered at global or regional or national level, ensuring recognition of rivers' importance in a local context that are not overlooked using broad scale definition. Overall, our long-term vision is that global swimways will be identified based on the agreed global standard or a set of frameworks. This is the type of approach that's been used within the protected area literature when identifying key biodiversity areas. 
And finally, we would like to embed global swimways within conservation fleets, uh, including an inclusion of migratory fishes and ecosystems that they support in conservation policy net commitments, such as the CMS agreements. I just want to highlight that, that as I said earlier, the paper is uh, freely available and I will put the link uh, to the free download in, uh, in the chat, but also the web explorer that are now highlighted. Uh, and just to, to finish, I'd like to thank all the collaborators that have been involved in this project. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to email myself or, or Arne out of that. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Tom uh, and Arno. That was fantastic kickoff to our session. Um, so as the as Arno and, and Thomas uh, presented, right now in the, the current version of the methods for identifying swimways, there are two um, criteria that were looked at endemic species and um, and uh, threatened species for uh, for migratory fish. And so as we're looking to build out the criteria further, we wanted to ask you in the audience what you think are some of the most other additional important criteria to include in identification of swimways going forward. So um, I'll ask everyone to please go to the poll. This is available on the same site where you, uh, where you were um, joining the meeting. And I will open up the first poll right now for your responses. So let me do that. Okay, hopefully that will appear to you. Are there additional criteria important for swimway identification? Please provide your response in one to two words and encourage everyone to please go to the poll and enter your thoughts there and we'll share those responses in a moment when we have them. I'll give you a moment to think. And Nick, if you can scroll down a little bit, looks like we're getting some responses in. Are folks able to find the pathable <laughs> pole location? Looks like we're not getting a whole lot of inputs yet. Let me put that in the chat for you. Oh, there we are. Okay, great. So interesting. A lot of different, a lot of variety in the responses here. Some around nutritional value, migration, connectivity, economics, representativity, providing food geomorphic and floodplains, volume, quality, socio migrants. Okay, great. Uh, thank you everyone for responding to that poll. We have one additional poll before we move to the next speaker and I'm gonna open that one now. So, 
the second poll is asking if you are in favor of a ranking system for swimways, for example, based on their quality, their length, their area, number of endemics or richness of migratory fish within them and so on. This is a yes, no, also a little more straightforward. I think Nick, yeah, there you go. Give a moment for folks to think on that one and share your thoughts. I think we're waiting still for responses to come in on the second poll. So if you haven't moved from poll question number one to number two, please go ahead and do that. You have to push on that vote now button to get to the options. Oh, yep, I'm starting to see results for that. Come in. I don't know if that, why that's not, maybe you need a refresh, Nick, why that's not showing up for you. Nope. Okay, well, let me just say what I'm seeing on my screen. Uh, I have a, a very clear majority, 79% of respondents saying yes, that there should be a ranking system for uh, the quality of swimways as they're being identified. So very interesting. Thank you all uh, for those those inputs, we'll keep the polls open. So for those of you who haven't had a chance to vote yet, please go ahead and do so. And we can finalize the results at the end of the session. Great. Um, so with that, we will move on to the next speaker. I see some questions coming into the chat, which is great to see. We are going to have some Q and A time at the end. Uh, when we'll be able to dive into those uh, questions that are coming in. Keep them coming in, please. Uh, appreciate all of the feedback and engagement from the audience. So uh, keep adding your questions to the chat as we go along. We're gonna switch now from this global overview of what swimways are, some of the criteria to identify them, to go into case studies from Europe, Africa, Asia, North America, and Latin America. Uh, we're privileged to have folks from all of these continents here today to share with you uh, case studies of swimways in various stages of development and identification. But I think this is gonna really help to ground the discussion on what is possible and what is already happening around the world. And we're going to kick off with Heather Bond, who's the Swimways Coordinator for uh, Wetlands International, and uh, really happy to have her here today to share with us about Trans-European Swimways Network that's being developed. Over to you, Heather. Thanks, Michelle. So as Michelle said, I'm Heather Bond from Wetlands International Europe, and I'm going to introduce this new project. It's running from this year, 2022 to 2024, and it has the uh, collaborators at the top of the screen. 
Some background information on the situation facing migratory fish in Europe. There's some statistics on the screen, um, and the most striking one is that fish populations have declined by 93% in this part of the world. So that's the highest rate globally. Um, so it's, it's a major problem here. What is causing this great decline? There's many threats that are similar to migratory species around the world. Uh, and in Europe, the biggest problem, one of the biggest problems is that the rivers are heavily fragmented. There are over 1 million barriers uh, on the rivers there, and many of these are no longer in use. So to address this, we are creating the Trans-European Swimways Network. Um, the name is a play on the Trans-European Transport Network, and this is a major EU infrastructure project that's actually caused the disruption of swimways through the creation of navigation and such. We see this as the regional implementation of the global initiative that was just presented. So the objectives are, are similar um, or closely aligned. Overarching is to improve the conservation of migratory fish in this part of the world. We're gonna do this through raising awareness and highlighting the importance of swimways, improving the quality of information and identifying key swimways for protection. And for Europe, we can also leverage EU legislation um, some more background on this and opportunities. There are key existing EU legislation uh, and directives that we can strengthen their implementation for migratory fish, uh, but there we can also influence upcoming policies. So the proposed nature restoration law to make sure there's better representation for uh, swimways and migratory fish. So the first activity of the project will be creating the network. It will bring together organizations and people interested in conserving migratory fish in Europe uh, for the points listed on the screen. And um, yeah, we wanna just create a stronger voice uh, through uh, the participation of these of different groups. We wanna make sure that it's cross-sectoral, the perspectives. So there's examples of different types of organization people uh, we would like to join. And then later we're hoping to bring in government water management authorities. So the next activity will be collaboratively creating a European swimways program. And some of the aspects that will go into this program are on the screen. It will provide more insight into the issues in this region and agree on a path forward for action, such as creating better maps. We won't be creating this program alone. Uh, we'll be hosting an online workshop to facilitate its development through the network and other experts. This will be the first meeting of the Trans-European Swimways Network and an opportunity to connect and share ideas. Uh, so we'll be launching the network next month and we're inviting anyone interested to join in. The more representation of people and organizations, uh, the better for the program and the group. So if you work in Europe and you have an interest, um, we'd love to have you on board. My contact details are on the screen there. Feel free to send me an email. And uh, thank you very much for listening today to my quick run through of it. Great, thank you so much, Heather. Uh, we're gonna move now from Europe to Africa where we have a case study from uh, Nancy Job who is the Freshwater Biodiversity Program Lead at the South African Institute or National Biodiversity Institute. And she's gonna be sharing with us about identifying a national network of freshwater priority areas across South Africa. Nancy, over to you. Thank you so much, Michelle. It's a privilege to be here in the session presenting a snapshot of our legacy of a, a numerous freshwater planners. Um, we've worked in South Africa since the 1970s, but, but really gathering momentum about 20, 20 years ago as um, South Africa adopted systematic biodiversity planning approach across both our terrestrial and our freshwater realms. Um, so this culminated in a, a freshwater conservation plan, um, which, which set out to spatially identify priority areas for the whole of South Africa for rivers, wetlands, estuaries, and our threatened species. And we call these our, our freshwater ecosystem priority areas, which is a widely consultative process and included many workshops and other opportunities um, to work with experts. And the resulting countrywide maps were supported with guidelines on maintaining our FIPAs and good ecological condition to conserve the ecosystems and species and um, protect our water resources for human use. 
um, and, a, and a key principle of, of, the, of the system, systematic planning approach um, was that sufficient examples of each ecosystem type should receive adequate protection and that the ecosystems that are ecologically intact and connected should be preferred in the selection so that we could safeguard important ecological processes. Um, so, so the systematic conservation planning approach and advent of the increasingly powerful GIS automation allowed us to allow this rapid analysis of large national scale data sets um, and setting explicit targets for representing biodiversity and um, assuring that the targets were achieved in an efficient manner with minimal duplication. And a 2000 and pro, uh, 2006 process led by Dr. De Bruyne and Jean Null um, resulted in a proposed conservation target for South Africa of at least 20% of each inland water ecosystem time to be represented. Um, for example, for our rivers, that, that means 20% of intact length of river type that's in a natural or, or near natural kind of AB state. And that resulted in, in what you can see here, you can see some, um, some of our input layers um, and then you know, a small zoom into one of the catchments, which, which, which highlights those areas for, for special protection and special, special management in the, in the different colors. Um, highlighting for our pract practitioners and, and managers where they should they, where they should give um, special attention, um, and that included fish sanctuary fish sanctuary areas for our threatened species um, and the, the surrounding catchments um, because we know that surrounding impact is, is what land use is what impacts on them. Right, and then in in a in a semi arid area such as South Africa. Um, our rivers are extremely hardworking, with very few of them that remain in condition in good condition, and and we have more than sixty percent of our endemic fish tank taxa that are considered threatened. Um, so I'm hoping our next slide will come up, which will show that that um, as part of the 2011 FIPA project, um, a set of free flowing and flagship rivers were also identified, but because of the kind of hardworking nature of our rivers. Um, we, we mostly had some short, uh, shorter coastal rivers that, that, that remain un, undammed. And then the criteria that was set for our major inland rivers was that approximately 50% um, area should remain undammed for it to be listed as a free flowing river. So, so as you can see across the country, we've, we've managed to identify approximately 62. Um, and, um, and then 19 of them were selected as our heritage flagship rivers to represent our diversity across the country. And those are the ones we really want to, to work on to, for people to, to look at, to, to maintain. Um, so, so with our free flowing rivers identified, um, we've, we've, got, um, we've been working on an updated um, fish, fish master list. Um, which includes identification of our migratory species. Um, we want to focus our attention to accurate mapping of species distribution to generate um, best possible data for us to, to build, perhaps um, building from our free flowing rivers, but a, 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 um, a sister uh, data set that, that is our, our migratory species um, uh, swimways network as part of our, our update. Um, so many new dams have been built since 2011. Um, we'd want to look at mapping where the locations of weirs and other barriers and, and perhaps finding alternatives such as fish ladders, um, focusing at, at discussions around unnecessary dams, etc. So that's, that's, that's what we're looking ahead towards. And just um, like to acknowledge some of the key authors of the 2011 work and some of the emerging um, fish information. Thanks so much. Great, thank you so much, Nancy. That was uh, fantastic and excellent to really dive into a work in progress on this and what it takes. And in addition to the legacy of, of the long history of work in South Africa on this type of analysis, and that's really laying the foundation for identification of swimways going forward. 
Thank you. And now we're going to go from Africa to Asia. We're very honored to have with us today Karma Wangchuk, who is a fisheries biologist with the Royal uh, Government of Bhutan. And he's going to be speaking today about uh, his work on migratory fish and the importance of swimways in Bhutan. Karma, over to you. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Karma Wangchuk from Bhutan. And I will be talking about our work on uh, studying the migration of this iconic fish species in Bhutan called the golden mouse here, and why is protecting and maintaining swimways and important migratory route is important. So Bhutan is a small country in the Eastern Himalayas between India and China. It's landlocked, so water is mostly fresh water and inland. We have four major river basin, as you can see uh, in the map. So the entire country is pretty much up in the mountains. There are about 700,000 in population and 39,000 square kilometers in total area. Because we are a mountainous country, most of our rivers look like this, uh, full of fast flowing rivers and streams, uh, full of rapids and a constantly changing riverscape. Extreme habitat. Uh, so these rivers are home to some unique biodiversity, one of which is the Golden Masir. It's a large river in Cyprinid found all along the Himalayan region. It's a migratory species, of course, and also considered endangered as per the IUCN Red List. Hydropowers are a major threat to the Golden Masir and its migration. And in order to come up with effective effective strategies for mitigation, you need to first understand the ecology and the behavior of this iconic species. Um, uh, which is why we framed our study around these basic research questions regarding the master migration. What does the master movement look like throughout the year? How far do they migrate? How do masters respond to changing water levels? And do masters actually migrate all the way to India where they are potentially harvested? So we use radio telemetry for our study for tracking the movement. Uh, we'll have a fish with a radio transmitter and a receiver station along the riverbanks as and when the fish moves, it picks up and that's how we find out where the fish is at a certain point in time. Basically a radio telemetry setup. So logistics is one of the main challenges of doing this kind of studies in this part of the world. Uh, there are no motorable roads. Uh, one of our team members is actually climbing down the mountain, making a trail so that we could actually access one of our receiver station sites. So we use angling to catch our fish. And once the fish is reeled in, we use anesthesia, uh, plow while as anesthesia. From our study, we've seen that it takes about three to five minutes for the fish to be fully knocked out. And masters are pretty sturdy animals. They can handle surgery pretty well. Um, we then insert uh, a thumb-sized radio transmitter in the abdominal cavity after make a small incision. Again, like I said, um, they are pretty sturdy animals. From our experience, we've seen that marshes can actually handle surgery pretty well. So in total, we've had 17 receiver stations, 107 fish tagged, over 200 million data lines, and we've actually detected 93 of our tagged fish. That's a pretty good recovery rate. In terms of results, so what does the massive migration look like throughout the year? So fish starts moving upstream as early as February and they do not return until September, October in the fall. They also exhibit homing behavior just like the Pacific salmon, which was fascinating because they keep coming back to the same home natal streams year after year. Again, emphasizing why it is important to protect those root where do masses actually spawn and how far do they migrate? From our study, there's indication that masses are using those side tributaries along the main channel for spawning. We've also collected massive juveniles from those tributaries. So how do masses respond to high water levels? From our study, we've seen that adults move upstream before the water level rises and they do not return until the water level drops. So flow and the volume of the water is definitely one of the drivers for the migration of this iconic species, which is very, very important. 
Dumasis actually migrated all the way to India. So five of our attacked fish migrated to India, two came back. We haven't heard from the remaining three, but most of our attacked fish remained within Bhutan where they are protected. So they could be a localized population that is adapted to stay within Bhutan, which is a good news that they can be conserved and protected within uh, the boundaries of the country. So what we still do not know is how do masters migrated Masir juveniles migrate. So when do the juveniles come out of those natal streams and where do they spend most uh, part of their life history before they are adults? That's something we need to look at. What we do know is that habitat connectivity is of paramount importance. These species are migrating upstream to spawn and any obstruction to their migration directly impacts not just the population but as well as their future recruitment which is why uh, efforts are now being made to identify and protect some of those swimways or the migratory routes. There are discussions going on to at least leave one of the rivers free flowing, so to enable this migratory species to complete their life history cycle, which is so important. With this, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for the opportunity. For those uh, wanting to learn more about our project, there's a documentary titled Tiger of the River on YouTube and my information is also provided on the slide for those who want to get in touch. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Karma. Very, very interesting and important research that has been done in Bhutan that is going to really be critical for understanding where those important swimways are within the country. Thank you very much for that presentation. We're going to move now to North America, where we're going to hear from Josh Reut. He is a senior conservation scientist with the Nature Conservancy, and he's going to introduce a short film about the restoration of an important swimway in North America. Over to you, Josh. Thank you so much, Michelle, and thanks everyone for joining. It's a great list of uh, folks in the People tab in, in uh, World Water Week uh, access portal. Um, so I'm lucky not to have to do a PowerPoint, but introducing what I think is a really beautiful film made by Mogan Entertainment. It's to focus not necessarily on the many, many problems that swimways are facing, but really to just soak in the values that we see when swimways are protected or the scenes you'll see from the northeastern U.S. when they're restored. So these values or benefits are framed in three categories culturally, which are presented by the members of the Penobscot Indian Nation, economically, which are presented by Maine's most important industry around lobster and the bait needed, and then ecological values presented by my colleagues at TNC. So the filmmaker Francisco Campa Lopez wanted to really veer from scientists talking at the screen directly like this um, to really some more rich visual imagery. And uh, I hope you enjoy it very much. And Nick Scaturo, thank you so much for queuing this up. Growing up on the Penobscot River, my dad would take me and other youth out to do different activities. And it was very much so ingrained in us from a very young age how important the river is. When I grew up as a kid, my, my uncle and my dad would take me out in the river fishing or would go out canoeing. And I think now, through the years after I've had kids, now and having exposing them to the river to see it how it is now is is a lot better than, than what I saw when I was younger. Now the fish are coming back, the alewives, the um, the salmon, we're getting a lot more of the sea lion fish that are coming up so that my kids can experience that like kind of how how it used to be like before they had the dams. This river has been here for thousands of years, and so has my people, the Penobscot Nation. And we have been utilizing it for our purposes, hunting, fishing, going from village to village. This is our highway. This has been our highway. It still is our highway. It is the Penobscot River, and we are the Penobscot Nation. My name is John Banks. I'm the Natural Resources Director for the Penobscot Indian Nation. I think our, our tribe is once again reuniting more with the river. 
because there is there is fish in the river there. We're part of this river. It flows in our veins. It defines who we are as Penobscot people and the river and culture tribe. My name is Rick Lawrence, and I'm the alewife warden for the town of Benton. There have been no fish here since about 1840, 1850, when the dams on the Kennebec River down below, the Edwards Dam in particular in Augusta, which was removed in 1999. And so in uh, 2009, when we first were permitted to harvest fish, it seemed rather minor. We were anticipating maybe $10,000 a year for the town and uh, an agreement with harvesters. But since then, it has uh, blossomed and bloomed. When we started El White Harvesting, it wasn't, it wasn't to sell lobster bait. It was to ensure that we had bait enough for ourselves, you know. And it's turned into a, a, a substantial part of our income for the year. We've got fishermen from our town that they will call through the day and don't want to drive the hour to come pick up a couple lobster crates worth of bait that they're going to need for tomorrow. So we'll take them home. We'll go in there anyway, so we bring them home to them and they'll use them the next day for lobster bait. Going out with my son, it it's, means a lot. It's what I done when I was little with my dad. Hopefully keep it going for several more generations. Several more brooks and rivers in the state that that are working on rebuilding the fish population. And after several years of seeing how many fish are returning and sampling and what year classes they are, and then uh, they're gonna, eventually you'll be able to harvest at other sites. And that'll be very helpful, I think, for all the fishermen in Maine. I picked this spot because we did a restoration here about four years ago, where we removed the dam and restored the floodplain. And it's a beautiful place that's healing. So when we restored the Setucket River here in East Bridgewater, we brought back river herring, which had been gone for quite a while. We brought back a beautiful floodplain that both provides important habitat for birds that you can hear in the background. And it also soaks up floodwaters. So when we get a lot of rain and have big storms, which are increasing with climate change, all of this area can soak up water and prevent it from causing flooding downstream. I think restoring a river, the best way to look at that is, is restoring their home or restoring your home. Restoring a river is restoring a home. It's putting people back or it's putting, it's putting fish back and, and the wildlife back to, it, to where they belong. And restoring a river is, is a natural way. I mean, that's the way that we should do that. We have that relationship with the fish and with the animals. And, it, and it's a whole it's a whole cycle and we need to do that we need to re restore the rivers so that we can uh, maintain that balance and know that this river is coming back to life and coming back to some aspect of of what it was like for thousands of years Josh, thank you so much. That was very inspiring and uh, just uh, really nice to ground this discussion and show what's still possible in terms of restoration for rivers that have been hammered over so many years. Okay, and now for our um, final case study, we're moving to Latin America. And we're gonna hear from Dr. Paul Van Dam. He's the director of Fonagua, and he's going to be sharing some work with us about mapping swimways in the Amazon and mechanisms for protection. Paul, over to you. Good day. Uh, as Michelle told you, I will give a talk on the mapping of swimways in the Amazon basin. Uh, identifying the current and future status of freshwater connectivity corridors. This exercise was the result of a wide collaboration of, of different institutions, as you can see. 
Now, the Amazon is known for its high biodiversity and its functional role in the climate and hydrological cycle. It harbors 2,500 fish species, representing 50% of global freshwater biodiversity. The basin has a vast network of free-flowing rivers. We can roughly differentiate three fish migration patterns in the Amazon. Long distance migrations at the top, mostly by catfish. At the left below, species undertake lateral migrations to the flat plain. And at the bottom right, a migration between nutrient rich and nutrient poor tributaries. No doubt, the gilded catfish is the migration champion. Larvae of this species drift 4,000 kilometers downstream and adults return to their birthplace after a 4,000 kilometer upstream migration. Not only fish migrate, many other species such as dolphins and turtles undertake also longitudinal migration along river corridors or migrate laterally to flood plains to feed. River dolphins, for example, migrate as far as 300 kilometers. This slide shows uh, the values and ecosystem services of free-flowing rivers in terms of biodiversity, agriculture and floodplains, river transport, fisheries, and recreation. The economic, economic importance of fisheries is enormous. Annual recorded fishing landings reach between 200,000 and 600,000 tons. Total fisheries landings in the overall Amazon basin represent $470 million. Thousands of people rely on freshwater fish to maintain their livelihoods and food security. Fish consumption is amongst the highest globally. Especially indigenous people are extremely dependent on, on their fish resources. Rivers, rivers are also very important for nutrient and sediment transport, which are basic processes sustaining river geomorphology and nutrient cycling. Floodplain forests depend on delivery of water, nutrients and sediments. In, in the present study, we defined a free-flowing river as an entire river that flows without interruption, that remains its uh, natural hydrological regime and free nutrient and sediment transport, and that delivers important values and services to society. The free-flowing fe feature of the Amazon is now threatened by infrastructure development, especially for hydropower. At the left, existing dams are shown in yellow and plants and or potential dams are shown in purple. Hundreds of new dams are now planned in the Amazon. Uh, based on a global river status assessment by GRIL shown at the left, we mapped the current and future status of river connectivity, identified freshwater connectivity corridors, and identified the most vulnerable corridors. We first did a free flowing rivers assessment and then mapped the distribution of migratory fish, turtles, and dolphins. The combination of the two maps allowed for the identification of freshwater connectivity corridors in green and rivers, which are very vulnerable in, in brown. In, in this slide, you can see the free flowing river assessment done in the Amazon in 2019. 16 of 26 very long rivers uh, are still free flowing shown at the left, but um, only would remain free-flowing if all proposed dams would be built. In this slide, the species richness and distribution maps for fish, turtle, and dolphin species are shown. For most of the species, you can see that the species richness is decreasing upstream. Then in the following slide, under the current scenario, freshwater connectivity corridors shown in green shades at the left are dominant. But under a future scenario at the, light, at the right, if planned dams would be built, the number of impacted freshwater connectivity corridors would increase, shown in, in brown. The loss of connectivity already has dramatic consequences for aquatic biodiversity and ecosystem functioning in the Amazon. In the Madeira Basin, the Bolivian river dolphin was fragmented in three subpopulations by the construction of two dams. In the same river, it was also shown that uh, these same dams resulted in a population decline of the gilded catfish 1,500 kilometers upstream of the dams in Bolivia, interrupting their reproductive homing behavior. In the bottom part of this a nice infograph, it is shown that extinction of the species in the Bolivian Amazon headwater basins is expected in 2024. And global distribution range of the species is decreasing with 25% as a consequence of dam 
constriction. As a conclusion, we should avoid dams on the large rivers that provide migration corridors and pathways for hydrological and sediment flows. We should advocate for energy and water resources planning at the basin scale, reducing infrastructure impact on, on this fresh, fresh water connectivity. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Paul. Um, you've really shared with us both a, a very interesting analysis at the basin scale for the Amazon, which is a huge region of the world and uh, highlighting those important freshwater connectivity quarters, but also the impacts that dams have been demonstrated already to, to have in the Amazon on some of these uh, flagship species. I appreciate very much that presentation. Excellent and um, great to see the work that has been happening there. Now we're going to move to another poll. Uh, for those of you who are uh, joining us uh, now, please go to the Pathable um, app and on your on your screen and look for the next poll, which I'm going to open right now. Um, I have to do that from my side. Give me a minute. So this is the third poll for our group. Oh. Where is it? <laughs> Damn it. Okay, there we go. Okay, so the third poll is about um, what's happening in your own country. So if you can reflect on and share with us if there are efforts underway in your country or the region where you work that you think could build towards a swimways network being put in place. And ask each of you to, to respond to that and we'll see what kind of response we get. I see some responses coming in already. Nick, I don't know if you need to refresh, but I'm seeing a big bar on your screen. Uh, and I'm not seeing any results. I don't know why that is. <laughs> it's okay, because I'm seeing them on mine, so I can share what I'm seeing. You may have to make them public on the back end. I don't know if that's selected or not, but uh, okay, that it may help. Can you see the poll on my screen okay? Yes. Okay. So, um, what I have so far, it looks like us half and half split of 53% uh, of folks. Oh. Interesting, okay. Results are changing in real time. So we have about 50% of respondents saying yes, they see efforts underway that could build towards swimways. And 50% uncertain. So very interesting. Um, we'll keep that, uh, the results are changing as more people answer. So we'll keep that open and um, we can have a final vote or final assessment of the results at the end. Okay, great. So with that, we're gonna um, move to our final presentation. I do wanna remind folks, please uh, continue to put your questions in the chat. There has been some responses to those 
questions that have come in so far. We will have time at the end for some Q&A um, as well. So please do continue to put your, your questions and comments in the chat. Very helpful to have that engagement. And with that, we're gonna to move to our final presentation uh, from Catherine Sayer, who is the Freshwater Biodiversity Lead at IUCN. And she's going to share with us a vision for the future for this work on swimways. Catherine, over to you. Thanks, Michelle. Just wait for the slides. Brilliant. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Michelle said, my name is Catherine Sayer, and I'm the lead for Freshwater Biodiversity in IUCN's Biodiversity Assessment and Knowledge Team. And I'm here today to talk about our vision for the future of swim waves. So we hope for you to leave this session inspired and with a desire to support efforts to develop and promote swim waves. Ultimately, the conservation and restoration of swim whales will support the viability of critically important fisheries that feed and nourish millions of people around the world. Their identification will contribute to bending the curve for recent freshwater biodiversity declines and will support restoration of rivers and their floodplains for a range of societal benefits. So what are the next steps to achieve this? First of all, we need to quantify and re refine the migration routes of freshwater fish species. Mapping the actual migration routes of fishes and the relative scale of migration will be critical and will require this information both within river basins and also for marine ranges for anadromous and catadromous species. At present, these movements are not well known and as such, we will require increased monitoring. New survey techniques, such as the use of eDNA sampling through IUCN and Nature Metrics eBioAtlas could help provide these data cost-effectively and at scale. Some potential criteria for swimways are unlikely to be quantified or mapped consistently at the global scale. So one example is the unique migratory behavior shown by three goby species that undertake vertical migrations at Akaka Falls in Hawaii. As a result, we will need to engage researchers, organizations and communities across the globe as a means for developing local scale data for these metrics and to help determine candidate rivers for swimways based upon them. Once we have these data, we will be well placed to start on the identification of global swimways. The approach will be underpinned by metrics of different types, biological, economic and social and should allow metrics to be used independently of each other to identify a swimway. It's really important that the framework is flexible enough to incorporate a range of data, and we'll need to have considerable discussion on how best to compare swimways across, across these quite different metrics. We also envisage that swimways will develop following a hierarchical approach, allowing them to be applied from national to regional to global levels, as has been done for key biodiversity areas. And this will allow recognition of rivers that are important in local contexts, but that, that might otherwise be overlooked by global criteria. In the long term, we hope that swimways will be identified based on an agreed global standard. This has been developed um, by IUCN in recent years for the identification of key biodiversity areas, as you can on the screen. And this process will require extensive consultation with relevant stakeholders to develop, evaluate, improve and standardise methods for identifying global swimways and to ensure their global acceptance. Pictured on the screen is the process for development of the KBA standard. Once developed, we hope the global swimways will be embedded within conservation policy, increasing the inclusion of migratory freshwater fishes and the ecosystems that support them in various conservation policy mechanisms. One example is that swimways will help facilitate international cooperation for transboundary species, for example, for listing species on the appendency of the Convention of Migratory Species, as has been demonstrated by the Flyways Initiative, which inspired the Swimways Initiative. Identification of a river as a swimway will also provide great impetus to protect and or restore it and its important freshwater fishes. And this could, for example, feed into EU biodiversity strategy to restore free flowing rivers. So we hope that this session will stimulate discussion and provide a building block upon which the conservation and research communities can collaborate to identify and prioritize global swimways. So please see this as our request for collaboration. 
After the session, you can also find out more by reading the recently published paper on global swimways in Frontiers in Ecology and Evolution, which was introduced at the start of the session, and that's Worthington et al. 2022. So that's all I wanted to say on our vision for the future. Um, many thanks for listening. Great, thank you so much, Catherine, for that vision. Um, I would say it's a great segue into our next poll, which is about asking the audience if you would be willing to contribute to Swimway program development. And if you are asking for you to share your contact information, we, um, we are not, let me go to the poll and open it. Uh, we're, this poll is not going to be um, shared. The results of the poll is not gonna be shared publicly. This is really just for those of us who are leading this session. And we would ask if you're interested in joining and collaborating this network to please share your information and we will um, put you on the contact list for being part of this effort going forward. And um, so that one, I don't think we need to share any results from, but we would ask that you please uh, do fill that out if you're interested in, in being part of this very nascent effort to develop global swimways around the world. Um, and with that, I think we will move to the Q&A session. Um, I'm going to open up the Q&A box here and see if there's been any additional um, questions that have come in from the chat. I know there are a few that came in that have been answered already, but let's see if there's any new ones that have come in. Um, yeah, looks like the ones that came in earlier have been answered. Um, I will pick up on one of those questions uh, that came in from York Freyhoff around uh, how the swimways concepts differ from the flyway concept in that uh, the flyways did not include economic information. And I see Tom that you replied in the chat, but I think it's worth sharing that reply with the, the full group and uh, would love to hear others' opinions on this in the chat as well. Um, so Tom, please, over to you. Uh, thank you, Michelle. So I, I think our starting point was that the, the flyaways was kind of an inspiration for what we were trying to achieve, which was greater cooperation for protection of migratory uh, freshwater fishes. Uh, we didn't follow, as I said in my response, we didn't follow the, the flyaways approach directly, but used it as basis to start thinking about it. I think the swimways varies in different ways. So obviously with the flyways, um, species can move over large geographic ranges, whereas within the swimways approach, they're kind of confined to individual river basins. And um, so there's kind of that geographic difference. Sorry. Um, also, I think what we were thinking about is it's important to try and get other measures of uh, what's an important swimway is in addition to both the biological criteria, things like species richness, endemism, or threatened uh, species. So we were thinking that you could trigger a global swimway based on other criteria, such as the amount of recreational fishing, how much dietary protein it's, it's supporting, and all those other things. Some of those things may be able to be mappable as a global scale, uh, a lot of them won't be. We, we want to develop a system that's flexible enough to be able to incorporate metrics that you can't say have a whole global map of wetlands. So some of the, the less easily mappable or uh, analytical ones such as sort of spiritual or cultural value, you could trigger a swimway based on that. So those were some of our starting thoughts. But I think one thing that we want to make clear is that this needs a lot of discussion about between different partners from around the world, different expertise and different experiences so that we get something that's useful. For
Okay, great. Thank you um, for that, Tom. So I'm seeing a few additional co or questions come into the chat. One from Carolina Parrott. Uh, are you working with Client Earth to help develop a legal framework for swimways as vital areas for re ecological reestablishment and legally progressing this right? Um, I will open it to the panel to see. I, I personally am not familiar with Client Earth, but maybe we can speak more generally to whether this is uh, being developed as a legal framework. Hi, Michelle, I can talk a bit like that about that. Um, so I'm also not familiar with Client Earth, so can't um, speak directly on that front. But um, I think in the long term, the aim for swimways would be similar to the aim for um, other initiatives such as the IUCN Relative Threatened Species or key biodiversity areas. So both of these are um, scientific designations. Um, we have a set criteria with thresholds and those are used to identify either species at um, high risk of extinction or sites of global importance to biodiversity. There's no legal implications of um, listing a species as threatened on the global IUCN red list and there are also no legal implications for saying a site is a key biodiversity area. These are more um, uh, standards which can be used to highlight either you know species of high risk of extinction or conservation concern or the sites that are important to them. Um, at a national or regional level these um, are often taken um, well these may have legal implications but at the global level they're never directly linked. Um, I guess one thing to say for the, for the key biodiversity areas concept which could link to swimways is that um, some of the, the large um, funders, for example, the World Bank Group, um, any work that they fund has to have no net negative impact on a key biodiversity area. So it could be that we develop some mechanism such as that for swimways. So once we have identified these, these rivers that are of key importance to migratory species or have these high socioeconomic or um, cultural values or societal values, that um, there may be something that comes down the line um, related to that, but I wouldn't imagine that there will be a direct link by saying this river is a swimway and this river must be legally protected. It's more of a scientific designation based on which uh, conservation actions, restoration actions can be prioritised. Great, thank you, Catherine, for that response. Um, I'm going to move now to the next question that came in about um, what is needed next to improve on the prototypes developed so far for global swimways? Is this both a centralized database and a decentralized effort to collect and create data? And Josh, that came from you. I'm not sure if that was a rhetorical question. Do you want to take a first uh, crack at it or are you opening this up to the panel? Uh, I'm, I'm opening up more because I'm not the type who would be collecting these data. But but uh, people like Catherine and Thomas and Arno would be so. I sort of want to know what's needed and and how we can promote this better in terms of uh, having that centralized database, but also in terms of what partners can do to get the data to the right centralized database repository to grow this program because I, I think it is worthwhile. Shall I chime in on that as well? And Tom and Anna, so if you want to add anything to it. Okay, great. So um, I guess for the, the, the criteria for swimways aren't yet defined. Um, the biological criteria, it's likely that the data for them would come from the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species. And that's because it's a, a, a global data set. We have um, kind of set ways of gathering data, coding it as such. So we can say, uh, we can share the results in a relatively standardized approach. So um, the, the red list assessments for freshwater fishes, um, we're currently completing a global red list assessment for all freshwater fishes, um, hopes to be completed within the next year, roughly. Um, that being said, once an assessment is completed, it doesn't mean that's done. We aim to reassess species every five to 10 years or as soon as new information becomes available. So um, 
if, if we want to improve swimways, we need to make sure that the data on the freshwater fishes are accurate and up to date. So one of the comments that you highlighted earlier was um, disagreement over the classification of whether some species were fully migratory or not. Um, we always welcome receiving comments from um, researchers, scientists, conservation experts around the world on species. Um, and it's very easy to submit those through the Redis website. You can find a contact link there. So um, I think what can be done at a kind of a, a local level is if you have data that could update a Redis assessment, um, please feel free to send it over to us and we can work that into the, the, the next iteration of the assessment as such. Um, for the other values that we're going to need to look into, so um, economic values, um, cultural values, obviously those data aren't housed in uh, the Red List database. So we'll need to either find other um, global databases that we can tap into, or it will be that we need to work with local experts kind of on individual species and individual rivers to get those data. Toma Anna, if you want to add anything, please do. Yeah, I'd just like to add on the data. I mean, one of the reasons we use the IUCN data is because it's consistent globally. And I think that's the key thing here is that we have consistency and data. And that's why I would encourage, you know, if, if there is local data that to please go through the IUCN listing process to make sure that it's all harmonized and, and captured consistently. Um, and I would also sort of, you know, echo what you were saying about the, the we haven't um, finalize the criteria. And so the data that we need very much depends on what criteria we plan to use. Um, and I expect that will be a mix of global data sets, but I think in some cases we will not be able to have global data sets on the economic and social values, for instance. And so that may have to be done on a, a regional uh, or local basis even. And if I Add one little last bit. I think I think we're at a period now where this data is being shared, and, like and shareable. So if you look at things like Global Forest Watch, Global Fishing Watch, they they've been incredibly powerful advocacy tools for looking at conservation. I think we just need something similar that captures freshwater fishes and, and, and these migratory species. So that would be, as I mentioned, pulling in ideas and thoughts from people from different backgrounds. And from Great, thank you. Um, so there's an additional question here from Jorg that in the interest of time, I might take it, which is, so at the end, a swimway is just a piece of water, a fish or other biter swim along. And I would say um, that's part of it, but not the full picture. Ideally, these swimways will be critical corridors for migratory fish um, and the full extent of what they need to complete their life cycle. Uh, so that is the intent with swimways that they be similar in terms of um, their conservation purpose as flyways in terms of creating these corridors, not for migratory birds, but for migratory fish and ensuring that those corridors remain open and healthy to allow migratory species to complete their life cycle and provide the services that they do. Um, and with that, Gordon, I'm sorry, we're gonna have to end and not answer your question, but I think we can answer that offline. Perhaps one of those panelists can provide a reply in the chat directly. Um, thank you all so much. We're gonna end now with a song about swimways that was put together for the World Fish Migration Day and created by our own Jeff Opperman and his um, musical team. And I will pass it back to you, Nick, to key that off. And we're going to end on that and thank everyone for attending today. We look forward to continuing this discussion with you. I'ma tell a little story about when fish are migratory They appear just like you're in a dream A 
Driving in your water courses Cause they're looking for resources Once they learn to swim upstream But we need to keep those swimways flowing And connected to the sea Conduct us to the mountains Come on, it's time now to break free We can leap toward changes and splash the truth Taking out barriers to close the loop Reconnect rivers, offer safe harbor Maintain connections for those that wander Shelter from the storms Nature-based solutions A landscape that is transformed We can leap to changes and splash the tree Taking out barriers to close the loop Reconnect rivers, shelter, safe harbors Maintain connections for those that wander Changes to splash the tree, taking out barriers to glory. Reconnect river shafts or safe harness, maintaining connections with those that wander. Thank you and goodbye everyone. Have a great day. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.